Funding for the art show is made possible by Montgomery County Arts and Cultural District, the Virginia W. Kettering Foundation, proud supporter of the arts in our community, and viewers like you. Thank you. In this edition of the art show, a Dayton dance icon receives a statewide award. I am an ambassador for dance because I truly believe in it and it's, it's never let me down. An artist with a 96-year-old passion. I knew early on, even from kindergarten, that I wanted to be an artist. Meet a man who creates to further a humanitarian mission. So the more I cook and feed, the more material I have to make canned art, the more I can sell to buy more food to feed more people. And a painter and entertainer's unique skills propel him to stardom. The cool thing about what I do is it's like children looking at clouds. It's all ahead on this edition of The Art Show. Hello, I'm Rodney Veal, and this is The Art Show, where each week we get rare glimpses into the lives and work of local, regional, and national artists. Sherry Sparker-Williams has danced with the Dayton Contemporary Dance Company for 40 years. Let that sink in for a moment, dancing, 40 years. Her star career has led to countless awards and accolades, most recently a recipient for the 2014 Governor's Awards for the Arts in Ohio. You know, dance is powerful. It can be healing. It can just say the right thing at the right time when you need it. I feel really honored and, and humbled at the same time to be able to say that. I am an ambassador for dance because I truly believe in it and it's, it's never let me down. Actually, Sherry Sparkle Williams has never let dance down. At age 52 and still dancing, she celebrates 40 years of dance with the Dayton Contemporary Dance Company. Sherry was awarded the 2014 Governor's Award for the Arts in Ohio in the Individual Artist category for excellence in her craft. The depth of the talent in Ohio is deep, and the selection process for the Governor's Award is highly competitive. Finding out that I was a recipient of this Governor's Award is annoying. I owe so much to so many because they do believe in what it is that I do. And that just makes doing what it is that I do, this dance thing, even more enjoyable. We work hard <laughs> at Dayton Contemporary Dance Company, and we play hard too. It's a great environment to be in, and I'm always touched when I find that people not only enjoy what it is that we do, but appreciate it. And this Governor's Award is an ultimate appreciation of that. Williams' dancing career began in 1973, just a few years after beginning ballet classes. I was nine years of age, and my best friend Thelma and I used to do everything together. Thelma's sister, Tammy, was a dancer with the Dayton Contemporary Dance Company, and Thelma started to take ballet classes. And she said, sure, you gotta take classes too. You know, so I started taking dance classes. Uh, we both started with ballet. But then within that first year, we had both enrolled in modern and jazz with Geraldine Blunden, who was the founder and director of the Dayton Contemporary Dance Company. That was uh, at the age of nine, and a few years later, I stumbled into the company, and it's all a kind of a stumbling path from there. By age 12, Sherry was dancing with DCDC, and as she grew older and the company grew more prominent and professional in its delivery, she decided to make dance a career after graduating from high school. Discipline was instilled from day one. I've always been an athlete, so I started out with gymnastics, and my coach there was a stickler for discipline, and, and then also I started to run track. I was a sprinter, and my coach there was the same. And Geraldine, they're three of a kind. You know, I guess excellence just imparts that. We trained in New York, spent our entire summers there, training with uh, notables and bringing choreographers in to create works for the company from all over, and that nurturing process uh, was something that led me off into a career uh, that was full of integrity and excellence that I try to carry through to this day. Sherry became known as Sparkle 
after a dancer told her backstage that she sparkled while dancing. The name Sherry Sparkle Williams soon began appearing in DCDC's domestic and international playbills. I thought, oh, that's a you know, sweet thing to hear her say. But when our next concert came around, they put Sherry Sparkle Williams in the concert uh, playbill, and you know everybody laughed about it. Oh, that's cute, that's cute. But then it ended up getting transferred to our touring copy as well. And it just ended up sticking because people started to call me that. And, mm -hmm. So it stayed. When I'm on stage, I don't really think so much about me. It's always a journey, and it's my intention during that journey to take people from what's thought of as spectating to participating, you know, taking the journey with me. In October of 2011, Sherry's journey turned dark. She suffered the first serious injury of her illustrious career. Her endurance and dedication was documented by Dayton filmmakers Julia Reichert and Stephen Bognar in an award-winning film titled Sparkle. I uh, suffered um, a hip subluxation and I wasn't thinking about would I be able to dance, but would I be able to walk, you know, that kind of thing. Going through that kind of uh, debilitating, uh, downright scary time um, makes me really appreciate this longevity, you know. My hip isn't 100% yet, but I can't complain, and I won't. Because I'm back doing what I enjoy doing, and I'm no longer afraid of being able to walk. <laughs> being able to uh, do this dance thing for so long is truly a blessing, and I appreciate it every day. I've always known that I'm blessed to be able to continue to do something I so enjoy, I love, and be surrounded by people who are amazing and, you know, all wonderful to work with. Not one to be idle, Ms. Williams' interest in health and wellness has led her to also serve as DCDC's fitness trainer, a role accepted by her peers. Dancers say they are inspired by me or they truly enjoy being able to dance with me, that kind of thing. They seem to think I'm pretty okay and I think I'm well respected. I like that. <laughs> What should people know about me? That um, I'm driven, my integrity is next to none, I am disciplined, I'm passionate, and ambitious, but not to the point of running over anybody to get there. I like this 52, I like getting older. <laughs> there you go. For a more in-depth look at Sherry Williams, check out local Oscar nominees Julia Reichert and Steve Bognar's documentary, Sparkle. Sparkle is a part of a PBS special called Lifecasters. Watch it on demand at thinktv.org. Search Lifecasters. Now switching gears, take a step inside the home studio of Eunice Parsons, a 96-year-old collage artist whose works are currently on exhibit at the Portland Art Museum in Oregon. Having begun her career at Portland's Museum Art School, Parsons has dedicated her life to her passion. Take a look. My name is Eunice Parsons, and I'm an artist. I knew early on, even from kindergarten, that I wanted to be an artist. There was an interim that, that Everything was on hold, but I came back to it when I went back to the Museum Art School when I was 34. It was life began. I walked on air for a whole year, just three feet up, my feet never touched the ground. In about 1969, I was laying out collages just as a pattern preparatory to doing silk screens. 
so that I had a distinct pattern that I could follow, a roadmap. And pretty soon I looked at the collages and said, these, these deserve to exist on their own. This is part of an old silk screen. This is part of an old poster. She's been really dedicated to collage and doing collage over a period of um, now 40 years, but really came out of a, a tradition from the Museum Art School in the Pacific Northwest where she studied painting and printmaking. By 1970, 71, I was sitting on the floor and tearing paper and I said, my God, I had to go through all these disciplines in order to end up where I started when I was 10. Tearing paper, cutting paper, laying it out, and it's, paper has been it for me ever since. This was when the artists in Portland, at least, were struggling with abstract expressionism. And I wanted to use the paper as loosely as painters were using paint. Oh, that's nice. Oh, boy. It's already weathered and torn and, and apropos. Anything is grist for the mill. Bus tickets, uh, delivery packages, Wallpaper isn't as good as you might think. So I want to show you what it looks like in the alcove. Because she was one of my teachers, and I started working with her in 1970. She didn't have a lot of money. She always taught school part-time. She started teaching, at, she taught at the YWCA and at St. Mary's Academy in Portland in the 1950s. But teaching ladies who come in from the burbs and want to learn how to paint, you, you teach, they have tender feelings, and you have to be tender with them. But when I got a bunch of kids who'd come to the museum art school to learn how to be artists, you had to hand it to them the way it is. I mean, no, no soft peddling. It's still hard to divorce your mind from figurative elements. She's so always been incredibly honest and very, very direct. And she would tell students if she thought they had really worked hard and done something that was of high merit. And she would tell students if she thought their work was weak. If it isn't good, forget about it. Let's look at the European stuff. This is from Italy. Thursday the 13th, Sunday the 15th. But for her, there's a personal narrative in almost every piece of paper. It takes a certain amount of chutzpah to go up and rip off posters. You want them to see the color and the form that inspired you. And of course, the better the work is, the more communication. So this is all about relationships of the of, of blues and greens to, and the black serves a, as definition. Well I think she has been a very successful artist because she's always been very single-minded about it. Mats that I use to. She loves spending time in the studio. Every piece is an exploration and an adventure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and you're finding out. And she's shown more, I think, in the last 15 years or so than she had at any time in her life. You know, here she is at 96, and, and, and you know, from like 82 to 96, having a renaissance, which is phenomenal. I think it's amazing. I know how to be a printmaker. I know how to make an etching. I know how to do a painting. But that's all in the past, and as long as I have an attic full of paper, I'm enjoying my old age. You put an image around, you put a mat around it, and hey, you've got it. All in one gasp, 
Of course. I mean, art is the whole ball game. It's it's the be all and end all. It's you know everything else. You, you know meals, walking the dog, every other, everything else is subsidiary. I mean, an artist is you're always seeing, you're always thinking, you're always. Uh, it's there. What a cool lady. Good for her. To learn more, visit 12by16gallery.com. Art can have a more immediate impact than one might expect, and sculptor Alexi de Villiers is showing us how, one tin can robot at a time. De Villiers volunteers his time feeding Arizona's homeless and then creates innovative sculpture using leftover cans. What he earns from his creations, he puts back into his mission. I like to cook and I like to do art. I like to make my robots. I, I think people need to eat above all. I mean, it's, it's the main thing in life. You have to eat. And I feed elderly homeless people in downtown Phoenix. They're heavy. They're about a pound and a half each. To be able to feed the elderly homeless, I use the cans that the food comes in to make sculptures. I make dogs, sharks, and robots, and uh, cats, airplanes. These cans have a story behind them. Every single one of them either fed an elderly homeless person or a battered woman at the shelter. The more I cook and feed, the more material I have to make can art, the more I can sell to buy more food to feed more people, to buy more cans to get more money to feed more people. <laughs> My name's Alexi de Villiers, and I am a recycle artist. That's a leg, that's a leg, and then that's an arm, and that's an arm. People have called my style of artwork uh, steampunk, but I never knew what that was until just recently. And I always thought it was just can art or recycled art is what I would, can, you know, recycle art, because now I'm into just everything. And the material I, I get is all junk or trash or just leftover things. I, I, I see it and I say, oh, I can make something with that. Well, I have no formal training if you, except if you'd call um, junior high shop class, high school shop class, formal training. I learned how to weld, learn how to cut wood, measure wood, use screws, use tools, sanders, drills, bores, everything, grinders. And now I, the tools I use is Self-tapping screws and a drill and a pair of tin snips are the main two tools that I use. One Halloween, I said, let me make a couple of funny things and put in the yard. This is an old DMV eye checkup thing. Uh, that's a toaster. The end, that's his mouth in there and just some teeth. And those are those Freon tanks. And then the golf clubs as feet. Uh, a lot of my art is literally functional. I make toilet paper holders and all sorts of different functional things, and this is literally a functional sawfish. And then I just started to make them you know, get smaller and smaller and smaller till I had all the leftover cans all piled up, and I just put a few together and said, oh, it looks like a robot. I cut the can in half, and then it fits right on there with four points. I put a screw and a screw, and then a screw and a screw, and it looks like a little foot and a leg. And then about a year in, you know, they're all stacked in the yard. My wife says, why don't you sell some of these? So then that's where it all started. Robot sale! <laughs> these are working lunch boxes. I attach heads and feet to them. You can put your lunch in it. And all you gotta do is make them do like a little push up and you can have your lunch. And you can hang, you can put your cell phone in his hand or you can put your iPad there. And then I've got, I use the, a lot of Cabbage Patch dolls. I find a lot of dolls at the Goodwills and things, and I use the Barbies. I find, I think that the coffee pots and the tea kettles are the funniest. That's just an upside down tea kettle. And I make the lamps. Uh, these are track lighting. The head is a track light and the, the fixture is mounted on the inside, so I just disassemble it and load it on top and I buy wiring and switches. Toilet paper holder, put your roll of toilet paper, put your air freshener, and some are just funny. I make the heads move. Maybe I'll make this one a sad face, so if you're not feeling good one day, you can just turn it around.
Growing up as a kid in uh, Florida, Miami, Florida, my mother had five kids and um, one paycheck. So my mother had to stretch the paycheck a lot, but I remember how much love went into making the food and how delicious it was, and there was always plenty, you know, because she would start out with dried beans, dried rice, and she'd go get a nice giant cut of meat and cut it herself, and there was always a lot of food for a little bit of money. So my wife and I, after a bunch of years, we moved out here, and then I got a job with the state of Arizona at the Veterans Home with the Department of Defense cooking food for the retired uh, retired uh, colonels and sergeants and stuff like that and they taught me how to cook in large portions and how to make it small so they don't really need a knife so I that kind of spilled over into the cooking now for the elderly we saw how many homeless people there are just right here in the park down the street from us so uh, one day we thought let's go buy some frozen meals and put them in the oven and take it over to them and it came out to like $55 for 40 little frozen meals so I said, you know what, I can do this much better and much cheaper. So the next week I went and bought rice, black beans, and a big old leg of pork, a Cuban tradition. And I cooked it up and I was able to make 70 meals with $50 worth of stuff. So the next week I bought, I made, I bought enough food out of my own pocket to make 120 meals. But this time, instead of going to the streets, I just went straight to the shelter. So as soon as I got there at 10.30, they were all lined up ready. So I just started to pass out the meals. And four years later, we've been just doing the shelter, the, the elderly shelter. Um, I just, it's, it's fulfilling to see these people that don't have anything. They're older and the streets are tough. My future plan is I want to get one of those empty buildings downtown there and turn it into a kitchen that works Saturday and Sundays. Plus, I want to hire veterans coming over now. So I want to show them, you know, I'll teach them to cook, teach them to do things like that. I'm sure they know everything, but I know you drove a tank there. Here, no one will give you a job shoveling sand, but here's, let's cook, watch, everyone eats. I like to cook and I like to do art. I like to make my robots. So I can keep cooking and keep making art and it just keeps going in a circle. These cans have a story behind them. Every single one of them came from tragedy, but then, it, it's trying to alleviate some of the tragedy in these people's lives. So, you know, they get away from their abusive husband at the, at the shelter, they have a nice hot meal, those cans come to me, and then I feed elderly people that don't have anything. So when you buy it, now you have a good story. This is Winston. You like Winston? I love Winston. I okay. Want to buy him. All right, he's all yours. We'll just take this and okay. go on my way. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> awesome. To view any of tonight's stories again, or watch an episode in its entirety, watch The Art Show on demand at thinktv.org slash theartshow. You'll also find bonus features and extended interviews on select artists. Finally tonight, artist Dan Dunn explores how his unique method of painting earned him the respect and admiration of millions and lifted him out of financial ruin. I was upside down on my credit cards trying to pay for kids, uh, five children, and we were trying to figure out how we were going to get them to college. My wife, she said, what are, we, what are we going to do? I said, well, I'm going to rent a mini warehouse, and I've got this idea, and I'm going to throw some paint. I draped it in plastic. I rehearsed for a year and a half and then I had my first show for 4th of July. And I uh, did Statue of Liberty in a minute and a half, and the crowd just went crazy. I built a webpage and it attracted the attention of a Las Vegas producer and he had a show in Atlantic City. So we painted Ray Charles and Lady Liberty every night. Three months after that, he sent me the video and I was able to post it on YouTube. We were getting uh, 85,000 views an hour and it was just insane. All of a sudden our life was changed. 
and people were hiring us. We could get 30 to 50 offers a day to play all over the world. American artist, Dun Dun. The first year, we did 100 cities in 11 countries. I've got over 150 pieces in my repertoire now from doing the customs, so it keeps me growing all the time. Oh, when I do a piece, I get images off the web and I study them, I put them into Photoshop, I make sure they look good this big and I make sure they look good from the back of the room. Then I take them out and then I start practicing and I learn them right side up and then I learn them upside down and I memorize the shapes because I've got to get up on stage and hit everything I need just with the shapes. And then I choreograph it to music for uh, emotional impact. The cool thing about what I do is it's like children looking at clouds. You know, you, uh, you try to guess what it is, and I try to hide it as long as I can. And you guess, and you guess, and you guess, and then I show you. It's either what you guessed or it's something different. And if I can surprise you and show you something different, the emotional impact that happens is like electricity, like a magic trick, and goes through the audience. And that's what turns me on. I consider myself an artist. I went to art school, but I'm also an entertainer. I consider myself an entertainer more because I have to be on stage. I have to have nerves of steel up there. I have to have confidence. And uh, I was also a musician for 10 years. I played in a garage band for 10 years. I played guitar. So all of these things, uh, being a caricaturist, doing wax on, wax off, uh, five-minute drawings for events for 30 years. This is kind of the culmination of everything I've been working on my whole life. And I'm just having the time of my life. To find out more about Dan Dunn's unique style and see examples of his work, visit paintjam.com. He's helped raise over $1 million for charity. So if you're organizing a charity event, contact Paint Jam to see how they can help. And that wraps it up for this edition of The Art Show. Make the most of this city and its art and get to an event. Until next time, I'm Rodney Veal, and thanks for watching. Funding for the Art Show was made possible by Montgomery County Arts and Cultural District, the Virginia W. Kettering Foundation, proud supporter of the arts in our community, Ohio Arts Council, Ohio Humanities Council, and viewers like you. Thank you.